Hello everyone, my name is Jochen Achilles. Welcome to my contribution to the Lefenu Video Symposium in the year of the 150th anniversary of Inner Glass Darkly, his most famous story collection. My presentation falls into two parts. The first part deals with parallels between Lefenu's fiction and Freud's theories, the second with some insights based on these parallels. Part one, Freud's and Lefenu's binaries, displacements and condensations. The specifically Irish, the intertextual and intercultural, theological and political dimensions of Lefenu's oeuvre have been extensively scrutinized by several book length studies by Ivan Milada, W.J. McCormack, Victor Sage, James Walton, and recently Ify Dempsey, as well as several essay collections. I will depart from the psychological approach to Lefenu's fiction, which informs my own German language book and my two articles on the subject. While other 19th century writers such as Edgar Allan Poe, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Oscar Wilde also have a penchant for duality. Perhaps no one else uses dual structures as systematically as Joseph Sheridan Lefanu. He employs the stock motifs of Gothic fiction in almost all of his works to generate dual patterns for the expression of varied emotions. Lefenu's systematization of dual structures takes the shape of reduplication, repetition, and fission. It determines temporal and spatial arrangements, characterization, and plot development. It leads to a nearly magical symmetry of his works and generates uncanniness. It contrasts demonic reality and reality as we know it. As of two elements of the same kind, one appears horrid and the other does not. Of two mansions or big houses, one has a skeleton in the closet or a mad woman in the attic or both, and the other does not. Alternatively, one and the same place transforms itself accordingly. Doubles or doppelganger, the brothers Austin and Silas Ruthin and Uncle Silas, for example, correspond to the duality of realistic and gothicized spaces, revenants, Camilla, for example, to transformed spaces. Puzzling and horrifying combinations of love and hatred result in love plots which transform themselves into often repeated murder attempts, as in Uncle Silas and the Wyvern mystery and the stories these novels are based on. Or in the strange event of life of the life of Schalken the painter and in Carmilla. Like Lefenu's fiction, Freud's theory of the unconscious is based on duality. The relationship between a deep and a surface structure, between the conscious and the unconscious, the civilized world of rationality and the unruly world of instincts, waking and dreaming, familiar and uncanny realities. In five lectures on psychoanalysis, the printed version of a series of lectures given at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts in September 1909, during his one and only visit to the United States, Freud characterizes dreams as possessing a dual structure resembling that of Lefanu's works. Like Gothic fiction, dreams are marked by distortions which result from the relationship quote, between the manifest dream content, which we remember in the morning only confusedly, and the latent dream thoughts whose presence in the unconscious we must assume, end quote. The relationship between the deep structure of the latent dream thoughts and their overt representation by the manifest dream content is mediated by what Freud calls dream work, quote, psychic processes between two such separate systems as the conscious and the unconscious. Among these psychic processes, too, condensation and displacement or transvaluation, change of psychic accent, stand out most prominently." End quote. Displacement and condensation have been interpreted as forms of selection and combination, the basic processes of Saussurean linguistics. 
Roman Jacobson's consideration that the rhetorical figures of metaphor and metonymy are variants of these structures to open the possibility of an interrelation of psychoanalysis, linguistics, and poetics, which leads to both Jacques Lacan's conception of the unconscious as a language and to David Lodge's redefinition of modernism. The narrative techniques used by Lefanu demonstrate how art can develop out of strategies of the unconscious, which are at the same time basic structures of language. In five lectures on psychoanalysis, Freud illustrates repression by visualizing it to his American audience as an attempt to remove a fictitious troublemaker who disturbs Freud's lecture. Several strong men, he says, take their chairs to the door and establish themselves there as a resistance to keep up the repression. Now, if you transfer both locations to the psyche, Freud continues, calling this consciousness and the outside the unconscious, you have a tolerably good illustration of the process of repression." End quote. In this spatial visualization of an inner process, the anteroom stands for the unconscious, the lecture hall for the conscious and the persona non grata for a tabooed instinctual urge or an idea connected with such an urge. Freud visualizes a psychic process by an actual situation. Lefanu's works can also be considered such visualizations. The factual details of Freud's simile are obviously derived from the situation in which he used it. If the academic flavor of this comparison is replaced by a feudal atmosphere of bloodthirsty unscrupulousness, if instead of a lecture hall we envisage a gloomy chamber on the upper floor of a lonely mansion, and if the rebellious student is transformed into a vengeful squire under the influence of laudanum claret or a potent mixture of both, the basic structure of Lefanu's typical plots can be seen to emerge. These mystery plots of concealment and disclosure in which locked rooms play a vital part are aesthetic visualization of the same psychic mechanism Freud tries to illustrate by his simile. Most of Lefanu's locked rooms are supplemented by an alcove, passage, or dressing room, thus forming the dual arrangement of a closed and an accessible room, which can be understood to represent the interrelation between the conscious and the unconscious. Lefanu's locked rooms are either images of a consciousness trying to ward off unruly instincts, or they stand for an unconscious restraint of such instincts. These dynamics of repression and the return of the repressed are as ongoing as Lefanu's fiction keeps devoting itself to the creation of an outside world that reveals itself as an upended world within. Part two, the visualization of the invisible, cryptic traces of childhood and Lefanu's writing cure. In some of Lefanu's tales, characters appear as closed rooms themselves, their secrets hidden, hidden in their paralyzed or comatose brains or behind a respirator and other apparel. In the house by the churchyard, Dr. Stark, a physician in Chapel Izzard, once witnessed how one Charles Archer murdered a fellow gambler. When he receives a terrible blow on the head, Stark does not die but goes into a coma for many months. Stark's comatose condition keeps information about the villainy confined to his brain. Black Dillon, a both unscrupulous and ingenious Dublin surgeon, quote, with the powers of a demigod and the lusts of a swine, end quote, risks a trepanation of Stark's skull in order to release the pressure inside. As a result of the operation, Stark regains consciousness long enough to disclose his tormentor Dangerfield's true identity before he dies. It is as if this secret surfaced from the unconscious by escaping through the hole in Stark's head. The House by the Churchyard and, in similar fashion, also the Room in the Dragon Voland and the Mysterious Lodger provide visualizations of the unconscious as a cage or prison 
which retains socially and morally unacceptable impulses until the repressed can be released again. The structures of dissimulation and revelation which dominate Lefanu's works suggest that the repressed which returns in the Gothicism of his fiction brings to light in defamiliarized fashion what remains repressed emotionally. Robert Lee Wolfe, a collector and of and expert on 19th century fiction, writes about the interrelations between Victorian mentalities and Victorian fiction. Quote, Unaware that Freud would supply future students with a new set of keys to the interpretation of character and motivation, they often recorded their dreams and their symptoms in a way that has become all but impossible for their descendants. Under most circumstances, only his psychoanalyst can know about a 20th century man, the things the Victorians sometimes unwittingly told us about themselves, and their fiction swarms with clues to character. End quote. In some of Lefanu's works, his indirection and discreteness in establishing and at the same time subverting atmospheric associations between the families who populate his works and his own background encourage speculations about subterranean interrelations. The Wyvern mystery reveals paternal oppression and filial submission as a transgenerational psychosocial system. As in Uncle Silas, Austin Ruthen entrusts his brother Silas with the education of Maud. In the Wyvern mystery, Harry Fairfield entrusts one of his servants, a former sergeant major named Archdale, with the education of his nephew Henry. The effect is similar in both cases, a delegation of cruelty. Archdale reveals himself as an extremely brutal child molester who turns little Henry's life into an inferno. Harry Fairfield's underling Archdale is more difficult to recognize as a surrogate father figure than Lefanu's more frequent demonic uncles or hoary husbands. Because nearly unrecognizably displaced, unjustifiable aggression against children can perhaps express itself so openly in his behavior. Archdale, the ex-sergeant major, engages in a hobby which is unusual for a military man. In his spare time, and when he does not bully little Henry, he devotes himself to building organs, a craft whose delicacy jars with Archdale's callous coarseness. The chain of associations which is provoked by this combination strings together military man, organ, and garrison church. It leads to the clerical world of Lefanu's family in Phoenix Park, where Lefanu's father Thomas was chaplain of the Royal Hibernian Military School. Archdale is a soldier with a penchant for a musical instrument used in churches. Lefanu's father was a clergyman in a military installation. Identification seems to work in the style of an assembly and disentanglement puzzle, or the rebuses which underlie Freud's dream work. Lefanu's late novel, The Rose and the Key, can, not only on account of its title, similarly be read as a roman à clé. The Freudian approach to Lefanu can tentatively be extended beyond the aesthetic structures of his fiction to the genesis and motivation of artistic impulses. Psychiatrist Leonard Schengold's soul murder, the effects of childhood abuse and deprivation, argues that too much aggression or eroticization in relationships with children can result in, quote, a sadomasochistic mixture of unbearable affect, end quote, as Lefanu describes it in Carmilla. In Secret Event in the Life of Schalken the Painter and elsewhere, Lefanu illustrates unexplained alternations of callousness and the overflow of powerful feelings, which resemble, quote, instances of repetitive and chronic overstimulation, alternating with emotional deprivation, which Schengel diagnoses as soul murder. Scrutinizing interrelations between George Orwell's life and work, Schengold considers 1984, quote, a primer on soul murder, end quote, 
and interprets Winston Smith's surrender to Big Brother as a consequence of Orwell's childhood experiences. Winston Smith's growing isolation in 1984 resembles the loneliness of the many adolescents in Leffenu's fiction who are exposed to questionable parental authorities. By the equally large number of demonic and benign parental characters in his works, Leffenu immerses parenthood in an opacity not so different from Winston Smith's emotional ambivalences with regard to the system he is exposed to. Uncle Silas may well be considered Maud Ruthen's big brother. Shingold analyzes the double think in 1984 as a systematic numbing of memories, a mindset of permanent liminality, which is described by Orwell as the ability, quote, to hold simultaneously two opinions which cancelled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them to forget whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into the memory again at the moment when it was needed, and then promptly to forget it again. Orwell's characterization of doublethink also adequately describes Maud Ruthin's attitude to her uncle Silas and resembles what Schengold calls, quote, autohypnosis so often used by victims of soul murder to effect non-registration and denial, end quote. Schengold's characterization of Orwell by the strength and pervasiveness of his isolative defenses as indica indicators of a problematic childhood are reminiscent of Lefenu's self-isolation as the invisible prince. Schengold points out that soul murder is not an unusual phenomenon, especially in the Victorian period. Quote, the lack of empathy for the child seems to have been so prevalent in Victorian times and was frequently passed down from one generation to the next as part of a compulsion to repeat the past, sowing misery even in the homes of the wealthy and privileged." End quote. The psychological problems Lefenu indicates by his Gothicism may come close to having been Victorian normalities. In some rare cases, Schengold considers trauma even a stimulus of artistic creativity. Therapists keep debating quest the question whether the childhood memories of patients in dreams and statements derive from their own Oedipal fantasies or from actual childhood experiences. It is obviously even less an option to decide such questions with regard to writers like Lefenu who have not left elaborate biographical information. Freudian insights are not to be used as tools of indiscretion, but may shed light on processes of artistic production. The urgency with which patterns of repression and the return of the repressed recur in Lefenu's 14 novels and numerous short stories is remarkable. His old oeuvre can be described in terms of variations of the same basic structures, systematically employing well-worn motifs of Gothic and popular fiction in the service of the indirect delineation of psychological deep structures. On the basis of Gothic patterns, Joseph Sheridan Lefanu produces psychological fiction avant la lettre. He anticipates both Orwell's dissection of mental processes in terms of manipulative social engineering and the interiorization allowed by modernist aesthetic techniques developed not long after Leffenu's death by the likes of James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. Thank you very much.